Circuit Python students, powerful Pythonistas, and magnificent makers, it's Prof G here to show you how to set up the PyCharm Python editor to work with Circuit Python and your microcontrollers. Now this will take a little bit of initial setup work, but once you do this, I think you'll find that PyCharm is super helpful with better code completion and error reporting that make it easier for you to catch the sort of simple mistakes that often trip up folks that are new to Circuit Python coding. I'm going to assume everyone here has already upgraded their board to the latest version of Circuit Python, and they've installed circ up. If you haven't done those things, start with the earlier videos in the playlist. Now this will take a little bit of initial setup work, but once you do this, I think you'll find that PyCharm is super helpful. So here's what we'll do. We'll install our upgrade Python on your computer, then we'll install a program called Tio, which we'll need to link PyCharm with our CircuitPy board. We'll download and install PyCharm CE, that's the free version of PyCharm. Then we'll configure PyCharm and create a PyCharm project for CircuitPython. We'll set the project up so that it saves our program to the CircuitPy board, not our computer. Remember, we want our programs to run on the board, not our Mac or PC. We'll configure our project so that it recognizes extensions in the CircuitPython programming language, so that's stuff beyond basic Python. And we'll do this by adding something called the CircuitPython stubs to our project. Once we do all that, we'll finally be ready to start our coding lessons. So there are a few steps in there, but once we do this, most of this work won't need to be repeated. So on with the setup. In the prior lesson on CircUp, we installed the latest version of Python on your computer. If you didn't go through those steps, you can check the version number by launching the terminal program. Mac users type command spacebar to open spotlight, type terminal and press return. Windows users, you should find a terminal under the start menu. Otherwise, you can download a terminal from the Windows store. Now you can check to see if Python is installed and which version by typing Python 3 space dash dash version and press return. Either it says there's no Python 3 or it gives you a version number and you can double check this version number against the version that you'll see at python.org, clicking on download and looking at this number. If this number is greater than the one that showed up in your terminal or if terminal said Python 3 wasn't installed, follow the steps to download the version of Python you need for your computer and install it. Now back in terminal, if you just installed or upgraded Python, you can rerun the version command we typed earlier. Pro tip, simply press the up arrow key on the keyboard and the prior command that you entered in the terminal will reappear. Press return to execute it and everyone should now see a Python version installed. Your version is probably newer than what I'm showing here. Now we have another issue that we need to deal with before we install PyCharm, and we only have to deal with this once during installation. Normally when you run Python code in PyCharm, it runs on your computer, but with CircuitPython, we're running code on our CircuitPy board. Now while PyCharm has an area that shows the results of an executing program, it's called the console, that console only shows the results of code that runs on your computer, not on the separate CircuitPy board. Now what we're gonna do to overcome this is we're gonna install a program called Tio, spelled like uncle in Spanish, that stands for terminal IO or terminal input output, and we'll run TO from the terminal pane in PyCharm. This is a separate area below our code in the same location where the console is, and TO will connect to our CircuitPy board, and it will show any output from the executing program or it will report any runtime errors. We can even use TO to run something called a REPL to execute code line by line, and we'll talk more about that in a future lesson. So we're gonna use the terminal program to install TO, but in order to install TO, we first have to install yet another program to install it. Now, since I'm using a Mac, I'm gonna install a program called Homebrew, sometimes called a brew, and that will let us install TO. Windows users need an installer called msys2. If you have Windows, why don't you do this? Search online for GitHub, TO terminal IO, and you should see this GitHub page. Click this one that says TO slash TO, a serial device IO tool then scroll down to find the installation guide. You can see the area for Windows. Click MySys2 and then follow those installation instructions. And after you've installed MySys2, then back here in the TO install guide for Windows, copy this command, paste it in your terminal, press return, and then meet us back after I do the Mac install. Now for Mac folks, we wanna open a browser and go to the very unusual URL, brew.sh, there's no .com in there, and you'll see this big line under install homebrew. We can copy this entire line here, so this is the command we wanna enter in the terminal. Just click on the little clipboard icon to the right of the line, and then I'll command tab over to get back to the terminal program. I'll press command V to paste in what I just copied, 
press return, you might be asked to enter your max password. You won't see anything as you type press return when you've entered it. Then just follow any prompts that show up on screen. So you might be asked to press return again at different times during the installation process. Sometimes it might look like things have stalled. Don't worry, it's probably fine. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to show any work that it's doing. Pay attention to see if there are any prompts in there. Now your install is probably done. This was the case when I first installed Brew. For some reason, when I uninstalled Brew and then reinstalled it just now so that I could record this lesson, I needed one more step. You can see that I jumped the gun and tried to install Tio right after but I got this message that said command not found. So if you have this message here that says next step, and you might not, copy this line here from a vowel all the way through the closing double quotes, then paste it after the percentage prompt and press return. And I have another jump cut update in here because some of you might have a message that says run these two commands. Now I got this message when I was trying to do a fresh install on my wife's Mac. Now my wife is not a programmer. Her Mac is more like a brand new Mac since it doesn't have all of the developer stuff that mine has from years of being a programmer. Now regardless of whether you have this warning or the one that I showed earlier, some other warning, do pay attention to the output shame on me for not doing this. Most messages in output don't make any sense, but you do want to look at it because up here it clearly says in red, warning and a path is not your path. If you don't know that term path, it's not super important, but it just refers to the directory or folder structure to get to a file. Instructions on how to configure your shell for homebrew can be found in the next step section below. And again, sometimes the terms are unfamiliar. The word shell just refers to the program that runs the prompt that you see in the terminal. For Mac, the default shell is called the ZSH shell. That's what we're using at the percentage sign prompt. But frankly, that's more than you need to know. What you should do, though, is always look for warnings. Also check out to see if there are any messages or commands just before you hit the percentage sign prompt. If there are additional steps to perform, sometimes they show up just before the percentage sign prompt. You might see additional errors or warnings in there as well. So if you got these two steps like I'm showing here, just highlight this first line. That's all the characters in this line. Note that this line runs onto two separate lines, but it's meant to be a single line of commands. Again, get every single character you see in here, then copy it and paste it down in the percentage sign and press return, and then do the same for the second line and you should be good to go. And now we're ready to install Tio by typing brew install Tio and press return. My installation took about four minutes. And when you're done, you should be back at the percentage sign prompt. You can verify the install and get the version by typing in TO space dash dash version, press return, and you'll see the version number in there. If it worked, you probably have a number higher than mine. Our install is looking good. And you should be able to quit terminal. And now we're finally ready to download the PyCharm program. So in the browser, enter the key term PyCharm, P-Y-C-H-A-R-M. And you should see the first link that shows up is a link to the JetBeans website. So click that, click the download button, now the first option that shows up is for PyCharm Professional. That's the paid version and we don't want that. So keep scrolling until you find PyCharm CE. That's the free version. That's gonna be great for us, but don't click it yet. This button knows that I have a Mac, but very important point, it says Intel next to .dmg. Hey, I don't have an Intel Mac. If you're wondering what kind of Mac you have, meaning what kind of processor is inside, you can head up to the Apple menu, select about this Mac. And if the chip says Apple, then the chip starts with the letter M. You don't have an Intel Mac. You've got an Apple Silicon chip inside. That's the case with most fairly new Macs. If that's you, pull down this dropdown and select .dmg Apple Silicon. Again, your download is probably going to go directly to your downloads folder. My browser's configured to ask me where to save this. I'm going to save mine to the desktop. When your download is done, you can minimize your browser, head to your downloads folder if you need to, then double click the pycharm.pkg file that you just downloaded, drag the PyCharm CE icon into the applications folder. If you open your applications folder now, you should find PyCharm is in there. Now, I also like to put PyCharm in my dock so it's nice and handy. So I'm going to drag the PyCharm icon into the dock and let it go, placing it right next to my other IDEs. And you can minimize the install window and you can drag both the .pkg file and this PyCharm CE gray installer icon into the trash and the installation is done. Now, before we create our first PyCharm project, let's make sure that our board is plugged in. I'm using a Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. It's fine if you're using another board. I've got one end plugged into the Mac. I'm plugging the other end in here. Always make sure that you're using a data cable, not a charge-only cable, or things won't work. Now, let's launch PyCharm. Mine is in the dock. The first time you run this, you might be asked if you want to open something that you downloaded from the internet. Yes, you do. So press open, and you see the Welcome to PyCharm window. PyCharm will show your recent work if you have any. Now, a bit of terminology. A project in PyCharm contains configuration 
configuration information that we need when writing Python code, and this project or configuration information is saved to our computer. Now when working with CircuitPython, the project configuration information will be saved to our computer, but our code is going to be saved to our CircuitPy board. Now for CircuitPython projects, our project will include configuration information such as use the latest version of Python 3 that you downloaded, and extend this to recognize CircuitPython basics called stubs, we'll tell our project to add any CircuitPython libraries that we plan to use, and we'll tell the project to save our code to our CircuitPy board, not our computer. That's important because when code is saved on the board, it's going to run on the board. And so we're going to go through and set up our first project with our CircuitPython configuration. One nice thing is we can reuse the project after we set it up and just change the code on our CircuitPy board from lesson to lesson. Now one weird thing to be aware of, a PyCharm project shows up as a folder and the project that we're going to be setting up to use CircuitPython will look empty because we're going to save our code to our CircuitPy board. But it's actually not empty. The configuration files that PyCharm uses are hidden. And that's because you never click on these files. You do all your configuration from within PyCharm. So if you look in a PyCharm project folder and you don't see anything, don't delete it unless you really want to delete the project and all its configuration information. And if you're curious about hidden files on the Mac, you can toggle hidden files between show and hide by pressing shift command period. Now back to PyCharm, if you just set it up, you've got no projects in PyCharm, so just click the New Project button, and we'll see the New Project Setup screen. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't show you the friendly Finder navigation menu that you usually see if you select a folder to save a file and give it a file name, but this window is doing the same thing that you would see, for example, if you selected Save As on a Mac. Now, the first thing we want to do is to select the folder where we want to save our project. So on this line here that says Location, click this little folder icon off to the right, and we can navigate to wherever we want to save our project. I want to save mine to the desktop, but in a new folder. So I'm already on the desktop. You can navigate there if you want to. And I'm going to click on the New Folder icon in the lower left. I'll give my folder a name. How about CircuitPython School? Click Create. I see the CircuitPython School folder is on my desktop. Click Open. And then we return to the prior window, but we can see the location line has the path for that new folder that we just created. So this path here is simply where we're going to be storing the project, but we also need to give our project a name, and there's going to be a folder with that name inside of this folder. And since I'm working on a Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, I'm going to call my project CPB dash project. Feel free to use whatever name you'd like and then click on create and ho ho our project is open. I like to take up the maximum amount of screen real estate. So on the Mac if you find an empty spot in the window title bar you can double click and your window will take up the whole screen. I prefer to do this instead of clicking on the maximize button because I like to see the menus. By the way I think this column's too big so I can move my mouse on top of the separator line and click and drag to shrink it. So let's make some project configuration settings. So to get to PyCharm setting Mac users you'll find settings under the PyCharm menu Menu. Windows users, it's probably under the file menu. You'll see a lot of options in the left hand column. Note that some of the options have expansion triangles next to them. Pointing right collapses the listings below a heading. Click the triangle and it will point down and expand the listing so you can see everything underneath it. Click it again and it collapses and points to right. Double clicking an item with a triangle will also expand or contract. And the first thing I'm going to do is to change the look of PyCharm. I realize many users prefer dark mode. I have terrible eyesight, so bad that I can't drive, so a white background actually works better for me. Now if you want to change mode too, you can head to appearance and behavior, then click on appearance, and I'm going to change dark mode to light mode. I also want to make sure that the text is bigger, so I'm going to click on editor over here on the left hand side, then font, and font size 20 should work well for me, and hopefully it'll be easier for you to read too. But pro tip, when you're coding, you can increase or decrease the font size with shift control greater than symbol, or shift control less than symbol. Now another thing I want to do is to make sure that we have an unsaved changes indicator next to the file name in the tab. And to make sure that we have that indicator, we'll navigate to Editor, General, Editor Tabs, and we'll make sure that the box is checked that says Marked Modified. By doing this, when you have unsaved changes, you'll just see a little ball next to the file name in the tab. Now another setting we want is to make sure that PyCharm does not auto-save our CircuitPython projects. And that's because our board will execute any code as soon as it's saved. And we don't want PyCharm's auto-save to randomly execute buggy code. So the way we turn off auto-save is on the left-hand side here, we find Appearances and Behaviors. 
and under that is system settings. Make sure you click it so the options show up. And my project has checkboxes empty for save files if the IDE is idle, and it's empty for save files when switching to a different application. That's exactly what we want. If you have checks in those checkboxes, uncheck them now. The next thing we want to do is configure this project so that it saves our Python code to our CircuitPy volume, to our board. And we do that by setting something called the project's content root. We're going to do that by finding the project name in the left-hand column here. You can see it says project colon and then the name of my project, cpb-project. You can see the same name in the folder at the top of the project column behind this window. So click project CPB project to make sure things save on the circuit Python board. We want to click on project structure. And then in the upper right hand corner where it says add content root, you'll see a plus sign there. Click that plus sign and then a dialog box pops up. You want to navigate to the circuit Pi volume. That's our board. So your board should be plugged in on the Mac. This should be in the leftmost column. You might have to scroll to find it. And when you do click circuit Pi and then click open. And our project will now save Python code to our board. Cool. Now we'll set the specifics for the Python language for the project. Click Python interpreter just above project structure. We need to select a version of Python that we'll use. You may only have one. Under the Python interpreter pull down, pull down and select the version of Python that you just installed, which should be the latest version shown. Now one last thing we want to do in this lesson, since this is a circuit Python project, we don't just want to include basic Python. We also want to add the basics of circuit Python as well. And we do this by adding what are called the circuit Python stubs. So to add the circuit Python stubs to our project, we click this plus sign to the left above the heading package. And this lists all the packages that we have access to. And there are hundreds. Now you should see a bunch of options in the left column, but a bit of a warning. The first time I did this, it took about a minute or two before anything showed up. You might also try clicking this refresh icon to the right of the search bar. Remember, if things look like they're not working, quitting, restarting your computer and restarting PyCharm may be the way to go. But there's a search field up here where we can find what we want. So in that search field, we'll enter CircuitPython dash stubs. Notice as you type, the options will narrow down until just what we want shows up. And with CircuitPython dash stub selected, press the install package button on the bottom right of the window. It'll take a moment to install, then click close. And in the project Python interpreter setting, you should now see CircuitPython stubs. In some cases, the CircuitPython stubs might not show up right away, but if you click OK to close the settings window, then get back into settings for the project and project interpreter, you should see that the CircuitPython stubs are there. Click OK. And at this point, we have PyCharm installed. We have TO installed. We've opened up PyCharm, configured it, and we created an initial PyCharm project working with CircuitPython. Let's close out of PyCharm now. On the Mac, that's just Command Q and you can press exit. And I want to point out that the project folder appears empty, but I'll also show you how you can open that project back up. Now remember, we saved our project inside of the CircuitPython school folder, so I'll open that up now. And inside that, we have our folder, CPB project, the name of our PyCharm project that we created. And when we open that up, it's empty, as I'd mentioned. But there are actually hidden files in here. On the Mac, you can type Shift Command period. That toggles hidden files between show and hide. We can see that there are a couple of folders in here, but again, we never need to click on these, so I'm gonna Shift Command period to hide them again. Now you might wonder, Hmm, how do I open a project with nothing in it? Well, there are a few ways. First, we can open PyCharm back up, and by default, it opens the last project that was open. Now I can click the red traffic light in the upper left-hand corner to close the project window, and I can see my most recent projects are in the Welcome to PyCharm window. I only have one project here. That's the CPB-Project project. I can double-click this to open it up again. Or another way to get here, why don't I close this window first? I can head up to the File menu, select Open, then navigate to where my project is, which is on the desktop in the CircuitPython school folder, and I can simply click the project folder's name, cpb-project, click open, the project opens again, and so now you know how to open PyCharm projects, so I'll quit out of PyCharm for now, and in the next lesson, we'll actually start to code, keep at it, for the skills to make something awesome, await those who continue.